Testament genocide uh, uh, in violation of that peremptory norm, and I can't imagine that there are any peremptory norms that I know of the United States would like to violate, uh, and is being prohibited from doing so by international law. Okay, I'm sure Jeremy will come up with one, uh, and I'm curious to hear that. I also think that the UN is a bit of a bugaboo um, here, because nobody's talking about the United States joining the European Union. Uh, the Europe is a very unique uh, legal, political, historical situation, and I wouldn't call that necessarily international law so much as a, as a decision to create something new. Uh, and so we can have a conversation about that, but I like, don't think we should pretend that talking about the European Union is the same thing as talking about international law uh, of a general variety, the kinds of law that we ordinarily both slides because this got mixed up. But here what I want to talk about, just to end, is what is normal international law? You know, because we can talk about law of convention, we can talk about START, we can talk about sort of these big fancy treaties that are talk, that are debated and discussed on a regular basis, but Truthfully, international, and most of international, is a lot less exciting uh, than that, but actually a lot more important. And so the kinds of things that you can do because of international are the following. You always know what date and time it is, anywhere on the planet, thanks to the Meridian Conference. You can mail a letter easily from any, to anywhere in the world. You can go to the U.S. Post Office and slap a U.S. stamp on it, and it can show up in Zimbabwe in a few days. Right? That is thanks to international law. Uh, we can drive cars with better safety standards. We can place and receive telephone calls worldwide. We know that a second is the same length of time everywhere in the world. Uh, we can use the same software and computers worldwide, thanks to international law. We can get an up-to-date weather forecast about our destination before we travel, watch news and events from around, around the world on television because we have a uniform system for transmission of uh, uh, electronic signals, listen to the BBC, BBC, you guys might not want to do that, but I do, uh, and, uh, and are able to buy more affordable clothing or goods. In fact, I spend less on my daughter's clothes today than my parents spend on my clothes thanks to international and increased trade. And so when we talk about international law, we have to be careful about taking these very extreme examples and pretending that they represent the whole. They really don't. The truth is that most of international law is operating every day in a way that makes our lives better uh, and that protects the security of the United States. Uh, and so we should be careful when we're debating these issues not to imagine that some of these particular examples, like the EU, are representative of the whole. And with that, I will open it up to conversation. Thank you. You just spoke on it, but I'd like to begin by just asking you, can you think of um, uh, some binding uh, article of international law to which you take um, serious exception? Sure. This is fair turnabout. Uh, and uh, I ask you if you can come up with any customary norms that were changed our behavior. Uh, is there an international law that I disagree with? Um, actually, uh, so the one that jumps to mind immediately is the recent Security Council resolutions. Uh, that were uh, passed at the behalf of the United States uh, that uh, are aimed at controlling uh, access to money by terrorists. Now that goal doesn't bother me in the least. In fact, I share that goal and think it's an incredibly important one and one around which there must be a, a global cooperation. What I'm concerned about is actually, and I think that Jeremy probably should be and probably is actually concerned about this. This may be a concern we share. Uh, that the way that that was done uh, was done through a Security Council resolution that is then binding on all member states. Uh, and that uh, this, I think, raises concern. It's a new use of Security Council resolutions. It's a legislative type action by Security Council, which Security Council typically hasn't done. Um, and it's unlike a typical international treaty which uh, requires national consent before the treaty is binding on the state. Um, now, Security Council resolutions, one might argue, you've consented to by consenting to the UN, but I actually think that, but to the UN Charter, but I actually think that this is taking a step further. Um, and in fact, you see some pushback even in the European Union, the European Court of Justice has said, Actually, we can't put this automatically into effect. We have to look and see to what extent this is inconsistent or consistent with our human rights obligations internal to the EU. So that's, a, that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, and precisely because I think it's, it's inconsistent with what I see as an essential feature of most of international law, which is that 
it's centered on, uh, on sovereign consent to the agreements that the, the, that the state is being held to. Uh, Jeremy, I saw you raise yeah. that. I mean, as you pointed out, uh, the European Court of Justice decided that actually EU law here will trump international law. So you're one example of where you say, I'm sorry, international law has gone too far. I'm siding with the EU. Great, that's really reassuring. <laughs> I mean, contrary to what you said at the beginning, this turns out to be international law as interpreted and presented to us by the EU. Let me, let, I, I want to ask a question of Brian because this is something that's now bothered me for, for many years. My uh, father-in-law helped negotiate the Law of the Sea uh, Convention or Treaty for the European Union. And for most of the time, the negotiations dragged on for over a decade. And he found himself sitting around tables um, and composing elaborate limericks, which he was then sharing with most of his uh, uh, colleagues from uh, the European Commission, where he then served. And this uh, uh, made me scratch my head and wonder, in this 1,500-page, or you know, huge monster of a, of a treaty, had every line uh, been thought through uh, very carefully. This comes to mind in, in two recent uh, instances. First, with respect to um, controlling piracy off the coast of uh, Somalia, there is some question about what, um, what uh, naval ships can do or must do before they identify, sink, storm, or whatever a pirate ship. And the Law of the Sea Treaty can be read with so, so restrictively that, in a, in a sense, if the pirates aren't flying the Jolly Roger, then they're pretty much on their own and explains uh, the treaty. Secondly, earlier this year, an unarmed um, U.S. naval vessel, I, I suspect it was some kind of uh, ship trolling for Chinese submarines, was harassed in the uh, so-called exclusive economic zone uh, 200 miles or 150 miles off uh, Hainan uh, uh, Island, and there was some difference about uh, what uh, exclusive economic zones entitle, uh, uh, entitle uh, you know, ships, naval ships, in terms of rights of transit, what, what they can and cannot do. Of course, if this is then going to be adjudicated, it has to be adjudicated in some kind of court overseen by uh, the convention. And I, I, in my course of my reporting about this, I discovered some South Korean expert claim that the Chinese actually had a pretty good case. So I want to put this question maybe to Brian or, or Laura, really anyone in the panel. When we talk about these international conventions, they're just so huge. They've been, they've been uh, haggled over for so long. There's so much ambiguity. But how, how reliable a basis are they? for establishing international norms that won't simply be read by each of the parties in totally different ways and, in fact, create more legal uh, confusion and chaos than they uh, resolve. So, uh, Brian, do you want to take that up first? You know, I saw so many uh, challenges within the UN Security Council on just coming to uh, agreement in terms of the implementation of very, very basic Security Council resolutions. And I think when you start getting into conventions, it becomes even more vague. And it's, the implementation side is everything. Um, we found in the context of even on Somalia piracy, in that case, we mostly just worked with the Somalis who were very eager to have us come into their territorial waters and do what we could to police piracy. Um, that in itself, you know, it was, was an extended and sort of tortured debate. Um, in the context of Iran or North Korea and some of these other things, in very basic Security Council resolutions where they say the Security Council decides blank, you know, dot, dot, dot. The implementation is enormously hard. And I think that when you, in some of these other uh, treaties that, that, that turn that over to some sort of committee that's part of the convention to decide how these things get implemented, it becomes even fuzzier. And I think that you risk losing control over, over some sort of treaty or convention you originally signed up for. So I think it is, especially when you have 192 countries on, you know, on this, coming to agreement on, on implementation, I think is almost unworkable. Yeah. Um, I would agree that implementation is 
education is key. And I think it's very unsettling for states that treaty bodies, which are referring to the committees often set up to, to deal with the treaties um, and to address maybe what they mean or, or, or take the reports from states on how they're performing under the treaty. It's very disconcerting.